Thursday, March 20th, 2008. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing George Myers for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. We are at Studio X Campbell Hall on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. George, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your background before you went into service and how you came to join the Navy. Uh, be glad to. Back at that time, you, you had no choice. You were going to be in the service. A and uh, I was a farm boy. Uh, and my mother was a widow. We were on a uh, poor farm, small farm up by Hoopston. And uh, maybe I could have been drafted to the farm, but I didn't choose to be because I was going to college when, when the war broke out. Well, uh, I'd, I had three years of college, and when uh, the war broke out, I had I had dropped out for a semester trying to decide what I was going to do. I was in the ROTC here at the University of Illinois, and starting the third year, I would have to have signed up for uh, an advanced corps training in the Army. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to be in the Army. I'd seen enough of the ROTC that I had questions. Is there something better? I didn't know of anything. I didn't know of anything except the, the uh, naval uh, publicity looked pretty good to me. <laughs> and uh, I, I had grown up in the time when uh, uh, the, the uh, United States were very much stuck on isolationism, and I can remember those pictures in the in the in the picture in the newspapers of uh, pieces of humanity that were slaughtered in World War One, and they really turned me off. And I didn't wish to get into this, but I knew I had to be. I, I could just imagine the millions of people that would be slaughtered, and was there a better way for me to serve? And, that, and so while I was at home, I decided possibly a, a naval, naval program would fit for me. And I, uh, you know, I think it was April of 42, while I was home, I, 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 joined the Navy V-7 program. That was the ROTC for the Navy, but it operated differently than the Army because ROTC and the Army, we were marching and doing this and that and setting guns up and so forth, but, but they weren't equipped. We had brooms that we were, <laughs> we were carrying around instead of real rifles. Uh, early on, when I was in uh, basic ROTC. We had Enfield rifles that had been used in World War I, but when the war broke out, they took all those to, to war somewhere. We didn't get, they weren't drilling with them. And so I joined the V7 program, which would allow me to take courses getting ready for uh, naval uh, service. I took spherical trig. Trigonometry, spherical, so you could have uh, 390 degree angles in a sphere, in, in, in a, on a sphere, so it was different. I took uh, astronomy, I took math, I took things that I thought might be of help to me, and I, uh, and I didn't know what was going to happen, so when I, I went through, I went to summer school to get out earlier. When I got out of summer school in the fall of 43, I waited until they called me, the Navy called me. I got very impatient because I wondered what was going on. My friends that were 
that I'd served with and, and knew were getting going through a lot of hell. And I here I was sitting it, sitting it, sitting it out. And I was glad to, but I, I felt I wasn't doing my part. I had a classmate at high school at Hoopston, my same class. He jo joined the V5 program, which was uh, the naval area uh, officer training for naval pilots. And he was in all kinds of combat. When the war was over, he had 12 or 13 Japanese planes he shot down. He was a super uh, hero uh, and awfully lucky to have survived. I don't see how, how a man could have gone through as much as he did. The um, ROTC people that I was with, they were already in the service and, and they, got, they were uh, catching all kinds of uh, hell and I was on the outside. Uh, when, when I was called up, uh, lo and behold, I was assigned to the amphibs. Hadn't even heard of them. I don't think anybody in the country had heard of the amphibs, really. And even to this day, they don't know very little about them because the amphibs were uh, the, the, the new ship, the LST, that, that could land on beaches. And that, that was, I think, a surprise to uh, both Japan and uh, Germany that a, a big ship, longer than a football field, and, and could carry heavy tanks, armament, uh, 400 men or more ashore, put them ashore on a beach, and then retract from the beach and go back for another load. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about that. I was sent to uh, Camp Bradfordton on the east coast, co close to Norfolk, and there they were putting us together, putting our crews together. And I got to be, uh, got assigned a crew. So you, you had been commissioned as an ensign? Uh, yes. Uh, there was another step in here that I haven't uh, mentioned, that after I got out of uh, college, they called me up for midshipman training at Notre Dame. And, and so uh, uh, in 90 days, I was one of those wonders. I had a commission in the, in the Navy. I hadn't ever seen the darn ocean yet. <laughs> and I wasn't very confident in that, but they had done a tremendous job of teaching us what we needed to know, giving us the book work and that sort of thing. And uh, we were well prepared because the Navy in their, in their um, uh, wisdom had put uh, half a dozen or so uh, tr tried and true veterans on the ship with us and one such a veteran was a guy by the name of Whitehead who'd been a, an enlisted man in the Navy had been on a destroyer that was sunk in the Coral Sea it, he said that they were in, in formation in a column and got caught some fire and and their their destroyer was hit and sunk before the ship immediately behind them come to that spot the ship just went on through there the other ships went right on through there and these guys were down in the water and, and there was only nine people on that destroyer that survived and uh, he was assigned to our ship and he was an enlisted man that was what we called a Mustang, that he, he got a commission in, while he was in the service for the kind of work that he did. And he was a, a tremendous leader for, for us. And one of the things that I've done uh, in recent years, 50 years after uh, we served, and now it's 60, uh, we started looking for the crew that was on our LST 635. And three of us searched, searched, and 
needle in the haystack. It's very hard to find those people. And we found enough to have a reunion. And, and this year, next month, we'll have our 11th reunion. And there'll be about six or seven of the original crew, but there'll be uh, other people that are family and that sort of thing that'll be there at the reunion. And we'll have about 30 people down at Tampa, Florida. Oh, nice. And one of the things I never, ever expected, uh, we found, we find that we were very, very close. We served together. We weren't particular friends. We were just serving together. And when we searched for the crew and found enough to have a reunion, my, it was just, a, it was a love feast. Our, our wives and our families all bought into it, and, and we, I have another family, it's being depleted by years now, that, of, of the people that I served on an LST with. But just as an example, uh, I uh, have gotten active in the Illinois LST Association. I got into that because of our thought maybe it would help us find crew members and the National Association. And uh, I've been president of the uh, Illinois Association twice. Uh, so total, I've been president for uh, four years. But those contacts that I've made through the associations helped, helped me to find more of our crew, helped some people who had lost uh, uh, loved ones aboard an LST, like the 577. I met some people down in Florida one time and was telling me that, they ha that there was a brother-in-law that had been lost on that ship. They're, they never knew what happened to the ship. I found that information through the contacts I had, and uh, I found a world of information because there were others that were looking for the information, and they put it together and, and made a log of it. Uh, so this bond started. Pardon? The, the bond which you established with the men in your crew started on the East Coast right after you'd been through the 90-day uh, program at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. So what sort of training did you have? You, was your ship there, or were you just training on? Uh, was, this, was that LST there? They had, they had a couple of LSTs there. Most of our training was, uh, was on, on uh, the shore, but they had uh, uh, some LSTs that they would assign uh, us on uh, a cruise. And we went on some cruises uh, on the East Coast and, and uh, it was sort of a shakedown for a crew. <coughs> and we got the experience that we needed and uh, now this this was roughly the hundred men that would later serve on the same yes, was, craft. So they had you grouped together already. They grouped us there on the east coast, and and after this training that we had, they put us on a, a troop train, and it was July. God, it was hot, <laughs> and there was no air conditioning, and we went through the tunnels with the windows down and the steam engine or the coal-fired engine blowing smoke out in the tunnels. When, when we got to uh, uh, Navy Pier in Chicago, our, our Navy, naval whites were just black <laughs> with sweat and all that soot. And that was a, uh, probably one of the first experiences I had with, with crew. And, uh, it now, was, was that just, just a stopover in Chicago, or was there more training there? Okay, uh, what we they sent us to uh, Naval Pier, Navy Pier, and lo and behold, uh, they were building LSTs a few miles from Chicago, on the Illinois River, oh. at Seneca, Illinois. Here was a little town uh, of about two thousand uh, people, and they were built, building LSTs there. 
They built 157 LSTs at Seneca, and they had 20,000 people working there in the shipyards. Wow. It was close enough to Chicago and close enough to the rural areas that they had people coming in to work in the shipyard. And, and it was quite a show. Is that where your ship was built? Uh, our ship was built at Seneca. It was 635, and, and it was launched, I think, in August of 44. And, uh, and I w I, those of us that were in the original crew, we called them plank owners, and, and we plank owners were there, and they, they launched the uh, LST sideways in the river because it, you couldn't let it, the river wasn't wide enough to <laughs> launch it in a conventional way. And uh, one of the things that's been uh, very interesting to me is that uh, the Illinois LST Association has been holding their annual, their, uh, annual monthly meetings in Seneca. And the, the library at Seneca has got quite a bit of information about LSTs that activity that was there during World War II. And, and uh, two years ago, our association built a, a monument at, in Crotty Park at Seneca commemorating LSTs. And, and so there's something there that for generations to see that that Seneca was a very important part place during World War II not a thing left not a thing left hmm. uh, uh, still only about 2,000 people live there there's there's not a sign of the shipyard it's all gone but it, at one time it was a tremendously busy spot close to Chicago on the river and we went and it launched the LST into the river. They put uh, our put our crew on the ship, but they include the Coast Guard people on board the LST to 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 navigate the river. Right. And we went down the river. We went under the bridges, and high there, there was people <laughs> on the bridges watching us go through. And, and, and we were almost close enough to the. Uh, uh, people on the bridge that they could hand cigarettes down to us <laughs> and that sort of thing and it was it was quite a show but we went down the river and lo and behold the river had trees along the side so you couldn't see what towns or anything you were going through just we were going down the river till we got down to New Orleans and then uh, they they finished construction of the LST put the mast in the, in the uh, parts of the ship above the, the main deck on, on the ship because it, it, you couldn't have them on and get under the bridges. Right. And so then we went from there after we got fitted for a shakedown in the Caribbean and we made an invasion on um, oh, one of the towns there in in Florida and uh, of course they didn't tell the townspeople what was going on uh, there were military people there and 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 uh, there was an alarm that went out and all of the people in the military had to report and so forth and so forth it was a, it was a uh, training for shore people as well as the, the ship how many how many of the LSTs were in your flotilla Come again? How many of the ships were in your flotilla, in your group, in this invasion? Or How many ships in the flotilla? Yeah. You know? Roughly. I, I think a dozen, but we never saw those ships. I don't know how they did it, uh, but we were all independent. After we got our shakedown and they loaded us with fuel and everything you needed to go overseas, we went through the Panama Canal and we, ne we were, I think there was two ships going all the way. Uh, we, we, the next morning after we went through the canal zone, it was a little reassuring to look out, see destroyers out there uh, 
going back and forth and protecting us and that was all day and then the next night when we got after the next night we got up there was no no nothing there no destroyers we were on our own one ship it was two ships two ships but LSDs don't have the kind of armament to to protect themselves very much we just felt we were expendable and and <coughs> Excuse me. We traveled all over the Pacific. We we went by ourselves. We we on except when we make a big invasion in the Lingayen Gulf, we, there was all kinds of support there. But most of the time, we traveled alone. And uh, uh, when we had a load of troops on, we were important enough to have a, a, an escort. But I'd say. 95% of the time we just traveled by ourselves in the Pacific. It's a big, big ocean. We, we were 30 days outside of land going from uh, Panama Canal Zone to New Hebrides Islands, Manus Island, that, that area. 30 days we never saw anything, any, any land, <coughs> how did occasionally every, a ship. How did your commanding officers know where you were? And know if you were going to arrive safely, or they didn't. Well, um, that was before uh, a lot of things we have now. But uh, uh, <coughs> Navy people have been, or ship ships have been traveling the oceans for generations and generations. <coughs> One of the things that I, the training I had, was to uh, be a navigator. And you took a, uh, uh, I guess you call it an azimuth, and you took a reading on the star, pull it down to the horizon, write that down to, uh, to the second, and then find another star and bring it down and write and write it down, and then go in go in the chart room and and we could figure out where we were by celestial navigation. I was a navigator. Uh, we were off the coast of China quite a bit later, and uh, and I was rousted out of the sack uh, one morning right after sunrise. And the guys shook me and said, "Come on, come here, get up here. The sun come up in the wrong direction this morning. <laughs> the azimuth or the <clears throat> oh, what do you call that? The Gyro, gyro uh, compass had gone out during the night, and the thing had been just swinging around like that, and, and our ship had been falling around, and, and so we didn't know where we were, except that uh, that we were we were following the, this gyro, and and, uh, and I had only done celestial navigation. So I knew there was, uh, in the training, they give you a lot of things. I knew that, that you, could do, you could do sun lines. So the only time I ever did a sun, line, sun lines was that morning. And I did some sun lines on, on where the sun was and brought it down to the horizon and, and found where we were. And, and uh, that's when you felt good about the training you had. That, they, they train you on many things that you'll never use, but who knows, maybe you would sometime. So, well, was, the, was navigation officer your primary duty, or did you have other duties as, my, uh, as one uh, of the officers? I was an off officer aboard a ship of, of nine, had nine officers aboard on the, assigned to the ship. A and uh, I was the communication officer. A and uh, the radio room was my responsibility and we had about four or five radio men there taking messages, messages, messages and then sometimes they were coded and, not, and then I had the secret code that I could decode those messages but that was my main responsibility was a communications officer. I was navigator not all the time I was aboard the ship. So let me come back to this 
You left the Panama Canal and 30 days later you arrived at your port, destination port where you were going to be we, put into a well, whatever. Go ahead. What, well, did, what happened then? We never did arrive at ports, as you, you'd say. Uh, Esprito Santos was just an island. And we were a bunch of LSTs and we just go up on the beach. Oh, okay. <coughs> and uh, uh, our ship was loaded with all kinds of war material and, and uh, it was packed full on, and then on the, on the deck there was an LCT, a, a little, land, little landing ship uh, that would go on a beach and had a crew of I think 10. And, uh, LST is a remarkable ship. It was built by, it was designed by a, a submarine architect. And, and uh, so when we got to Manus Island and we wanted to get rid of, to launch our LCT off the deck, we just uh, released all the cables that fastened it, pumped the water out of one side, made the ship lurch over to the side, because of the tanks, it slid off in the water. Huh. It worked. <laughs> I take it that worked. It sure. didn't sink or anything silly like that, no. And everything that was you were hauling on an LST was all always uh, buckled down because an LST is a flat bottom ship and I don't know how, no, how they could survive in the Atlantic but the uh, Pacific, for the most part, is very calm, and so it was just uh, just kind of a cruise. Now we had we got into one or two uh, what do we call them uh, typhoons or typhoon. <clears throat> In fact, there's a typhoon that right at the end of the World War II, when we would have been uh, going getting ready to go to Japan. We it, it would have we'd have had a big big problem with that typhoon. Uh, that typhoon was so strong that some capital ships sank, but LST or were broken up. But LSTs all rode it out, and the, it was a long flexible ship. And, and some people said it kind of snaked through the water. <laughs> well, when you're in that kind of water, uh, you could see the ship. The, the uh, uh, deck bending. If you were down below, the, the the bulkheads would crack and pop as it as it the stress went on them. But the ship would could ride those things out. Wow. It's a remarkably uh, well designed ship. Why don't you tell us what you were doing after you arrived in the Pacific Theater? What sorts of activities were, were involved. Well, we were assigned to MacArthur's group and, and he started down in New Guinea. Uh, uh, you know from, from Manus we went to uh, uh, to New Guinea and uh, Jim, uh, Jim Fisher had a lot of experience in that area. He's going to be talking to you later. Uh, we went into New Guinea uh, at Itapi and Hollandia and loaded up equipment and personnel to to take up to the Lingayen Gulf invasion, and that's the first activity we saw. And that was a humongous operation. Uh, ships as far as you could see. 13 miles that way, 13 miles that way, 13, 13, and you were just in the center of that as far as you could see were ships. And uh, so d down in New Guinea, we loaded up to make the invasion in the Philippines. And you, you were saying you had personnel as well as equipment on your? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we'd have. Uh, were these Marines or? Well, I believe in every case they were Army. Okay. We might have had Marines on at one time, but we had Army personnel. And, and well, I remember we had one group that was that were part of MacArthur's uh, 
headquarters, and mm -hmm. I, I can I can still picture the little I shouldn't say little, but the the um, army guy. He didn't have any rank, but he ha he felt like he was responsible for these things that were MacArthur's, and uh, he had more um, say than you could imagine <laughs> because he was protecting MacArthur's equipment on board. Uh, MacArthur, I have a great, great uh, admiration for him because what we were doing, uh, taking a part of, was going from one island where it, where he secured a perimeter and, and put in an airfield, and, and then then we'd uh, pick that up and secure another perimeter, pick that up, secure another one. We we went all the way to uh, Philippines and then Japan by just island hopping. And, and MacArthur didn't care, didn't seem to worry about the Japanese that were in the caves and that sort of thing. Uh, the, the battles that we you heard about, uh, this horif horrific uh, battles of dragging the Japanese out of the caves, very little of that happened under MacArthur's command because all he was interested in was was securing a perimeter. If there were caves there, he had to do that. But we just island hopped all the way to uh, the Philippines, and then we were we were getting ready to make the invasion of Japan. When uh, we were, I don't know, we were out to sea somewhere when the uh, notice came through over the radio, and that see that was a part of the thing that I had responsibility for. That the war was over, and as you already heard, that they had dropped the first atom bomb. We heard about the bombs, right? And then the end of the war, and then the end of the war come a few days later. I felt a little bit frustrated. I had a little bit of scientific training here at the, at U of I, and I was very blown away with the idea of an atomic bomb. And I can remember I was talking to different members on our ship. And, and they said, oh, it's just another bomb. Well, no, I'm trying to say this is the beginning of a new age, an atomic age. And then, uh, then come the uh, uh, surrender of Japan because it was a terrific, uh, terrific bomb. And so then after the war was over, we had, we, we got, I, I was on a couple islands in Japan. We went to Yokohama and, and, and on Liberty while we were uh, on Japan. And the thing that impressed me so much, the, the war had been over just a matter of a few weeks. I doubt whether these Japanese folks had seen any Americans. But we went on Liberty and we went on Liberty after dark, just uh, two or three, four of us separately, and we didn't feel that we were in any danger at all. We might have been, but we didn't feel that we were, and I never heard of, of the Japanese uh, taking out any of their anger on the, on the Americans. If it was our country, I don't know whether we'd... I, we couldn't walk through uh, the dark streets of Chicago let alone like we were walking through the uh, streets of Japan immediately after the war. The other thing that I was so impressed about the Japanese that we had we had just destroyed so much of that country. Ginza Strip was a was a very uh, industrial and. Uh, uh, Developed area is what I'm trying to say, and that was gone. This is Ginza Street. Well, there was nothing there but a park, green grass, and everything. They picked up all the the uh, refuse and and did something with it. We were in Japan and in China and other places, and the the rubble from previous wars were still there. And here, a month after the war was over, the the 
Japanese had cleaned up the debris that in the areas where, where I was. They were very, very, very industrious people. And uh, I've had an opportunity. I, we had an opportunity to, uh, after, immediately after the war to go to China also. And the uh, fact was that, uh, that I, I got rotated off uh, and, and before the ship was decommissioned in the Yang, Yangpu River of China. But I had been there with the ship in the Yangpu, and, and uh, I had to, I come away from experience aboard this ship of, of a lot of respect for the uh, Asiatic people. They're different, but they're all, I just have an enormous respect for them. And uh, what, uh, what was your ship doing something military when it was down on the China, in, in China or? Well, we were doing things that, just like we were just moving personnel and equipment around. When we went to Japan or China, uh, uh, see there was a there was a um, sort of a revolution going on in China, and uh, we we were moving what I kind of said well we were moving the Chinese around so they could so they could continue their revolution. Hmm. Uh, so these were the Chiang Kai-shek troops, perhaps. Being yeah, I, I can't quite. Right. But but uh, but we the World War II was over, but something else was going on in in uh, China. Quite. A and uh, 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 after the war, there, we had United Nations Relief Organization UNRWA, and you got over to China, you had SINRA, C N R A. And uh, so we were moving stuff in that the Chinese needed. And, uh, and every country, every place you go is different. And, and so I can remember uh, we had unloaded stuff and it seemed that, that the stuff was unloaded on China and then when you go through it, Certain providence, uh, the, your, each providence ha had its own autonomy. Uh, 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 and so uh, if you're going to go through here, we're going to take this and this is the way it <laughs> seemed to work. So the and, provincial officials yes, took their and, payments. And, and so and as it went from around and around, uh, the local people, uh, the local government, Seem to be re able and re and uh, allowed to uh, sort of tax the stuff that was going through. They they take theirs, what they want, let the rest go through. It was an interesting thing to observe. Interesting administrative situation. You're you're a naval vessel, but you're being taxed by the local government, so to speak. No, this was the equipment, the things that we hauled in there. Yeah, but you're still you're well, a naval it was American vessel. stuff and yeah. uh, that. Uh, we it was Chinese relief. Okay, but but uh, how much it was going to get where it needed to be? Well, uh, maybe it's, that's just the way it was done. Well, but before we talk about your being leaving the service, would you like to go back and discuss any of the the, the invasions that your your craft was on? I mean, what was what would happen in an invasion? Would you be landing early in the invasion or later after the beachhead had been established? How did these work? Well, Jim Fisher can talk more about that because, uh, as a matter of fact, the, when we make the, made the beaches, no one ever fired at us. Uh, things were pretty well secured. So I had a, a trip in the a cruise that was very uneventful, even the fact that I, I can show you about 20 different places in the Pacific that we were, it was uneventful as far as combat. It, we were just moving things. So you were like a 
truck on water. You were, you were the transportation corps of the Navy. Yes, that's it, what yeah. it was. In the Army, I mean, we, uh, we carried 50 ton tanks on that LST wow. <clears throat> and put them ashore. But most of the things we were, the things that you needed for a war or for rehab, rehab, rehabilitation, uh, we, we uh, were bringing ashore. And then there was uh, uh, the red ball lines. These were, there were a whole series of trucks with red balls uh, painted on them. Right. And those, they'd load those trucks up and then travel uh, terrific speeds. Uh, and uh, uh, we were just bringing it to where these kind of people could get a hold of it and, and, and run with it, go with it. So it must have given you an appreciation for all of the logistics that go on in planning a battle, all the things behind the scenes that have to occur. I don't were, know about the logistics. Well, we, but you were part of those logistics uh, in the sense that you were, uh, your ship was, I mean. Yes. Uh, we just took the orders and, and carried out what we were assigned to do. We were not, uh, we were not heroes on the 635. You're going to talk to some other people that are heroes and that lost people in, in combat. We didn't lose anybody in combat. We lost some people, but that's still some more stories. But it was in... Uh, Did you want to talk about any of the, the losses that you had? Uh, the what? Did you want to talk about any of the losses that occurred on your ship? or We didn't really have any losses. Oh, okay. You said you lost some people. Non well, uh, we had people that, uh, we had uh, one that I felt so badly about. We had a full-blooded Indian. Uh, I can't recall what tribe he was. His name was Blue Arm. And, and he got sick and died aboard our ship. Oh. And uh, it, it turned out that it was some kind of a... Uh, uh, a disease that he, was in his in his inheritance, and uh, and uh, the poor guy died, and and we are landlubbers, and and so uh, I would, wasn't a part of it, but I knew it happened. They put him in the cooler till we got to uh, uh, back on land, and oh my, he should have been buried at sea. We didn't do that because that we we weren't into that kind of thing. Uh, one time, uh, we we had a very very competent uh, a pharmacist mate, and. Uh, since we were flag officer, flag ship, we got uh, word that there was a, a man that was sick on board another LST. He seemed to have appendicitis. And so our pharmacist mate got, a, got on board the small boat and went over to the uh, other LST. He performed an appendectomy. On wow. this sailor, he'd never seen it done, but it needed to be done, and, and he had a had a medical doctor on the telephone talking to him as he did it. The guy survived and did all right. Now, I I've heard stories being told uh, that this happened in other uh, on board other ships, but at aboard uh, our pharmacist mate performed a appendectomy. Uh, he was a good pharmacist mate, but he'd never seen an appendectomy operation, but he performed one without having seen one. There's things like that that happened that uh, were, there's, there were a lot of heroes out there in the war, but they were so many, most of them were unknown, uh, like this 
Mustang engine that just took command of our took control of our ship and saw that we knew how to to survive in combat and so forth. He was the real hero that I saw in in the in the my naval period because he knew what had to be done. He knew how to train us to do it, and and he was real hard on us. It, any time, night or day, that he thought that, that we ought to be uh, uh, alerted to what to do if, if such and such a thing happened. How many, how many ships were, in the, were under the command of your flag officer? You know, I don't know. Around a dozen, yeah. I guess. So did you move as a group or were you? Never as a group. I see. And we moved LSTs around, and here'd be an LST we'd never seen before, and another one we hadn't seen before, and we'd move together, and then next time it'd be uh, some other. I don't know. Uh, there was a lot of organization that I didn't see, but it worked. I didn't see any snafus that were uh, uh, serious. Except, like, I, I, I think I was, I'm thinking about the fact that we were a flagship and uh, we had a, a, two lieutenants assigned, one for the skipper and one was the executive officer, and they were trained with the idea that they were in command of the ship. And they were. But here come a flag officer aboard who was a, an academy man, who, he was a commander, uh, who I doubt whether he'd had a very auspicious naval career up to that point. And he probably had been retired from the Navy because he couldn't be promoted, but the war came along and here he was out there as, a, uh, as our flag officer. And he was out there to make a name for himself. And he was in charge of everything. And the skipper and the exec said, well, we thought we were supposed to be in charge. They were supposed to be in of charge. Of the ship, yeah. So, uh, you know, that was an un unsatisfactory situation. So uh, the commander had those had the our skipper and our executive officer court martialed for on a trumped up charge so get him off the ship so he could so he could be what he wanted to be. Uh, Did it work? Did they well, leave the he ship? He got rid of them. Oh my gosh. And we got uh, two more officers uh, to be uh, skipper and executive and, and they were good officers and so there's no uh, no loss really as far as our ship was concerned. I just feel bad for the careers of the of these uh, uh, the the previous exec and uh, and skipper, but of course they were just uh, uh, reserves like reservists like I was, and so that was just a part of their career and it shouldn't have ruined their life, but it no. was a, a very uh, hard thing to see. This skipper, or I mean this commander, uh, I have, none of us had much uh, good feeling, no good feeling for him, because he was trying to make a career and we were just trying to get the war over. A and uh, so he would take charge. He, he would uh, I, I, in our, our minutes, we can, I, I could show you that when somebody would see something floating out in the ocean and he'd come up and pronounce it this or that and somebody else would say, well, I don't think so, but he, whatever he said, he, he would stick by it and he, he was always wrong. Hmm. And, and uh, for example, uh, uh, we had these small boats that go ashore, back and forth ashore. One, t one time he t took, was taking the small boat ashore and, and the coxswain, of course, was 
piloting the small boat where he knew he should be. And the commander said, oh, go over here. Go this way. No, that's not the way to go. I said, go this way. And so they run the uh, small boat aground or hit a, a coral reef and had to back off and made the trip around and to come back and tied the small boat up to the boom. And that night, the small boat sank. And so uh, the, the commander come up the next day and found out who was the officer of the deck. When the small boat sank, he didn't tell anybody that, that, that he'd had an accident with the boat. The coxswain knew about it, and he told us. The, the boat sank, and he, and he wrote a reprimand in the officer of the deck's uh, uh, jacket for allowing that thing to happen. Huh. Uh, he, he was he just was he he was just focused on what he uh, saw that might make a career for himself and not not winning the war or anything like that. And he probably saved our lives because uh, Jim that uh, will be talking to you probably made ten. Uh, invasions and we were out there going kind of like on a cruise because this this commander didn't get our ship in any trouble I see but it was a great it was the experience of a lifetime that was compressed in four years so now that the war is over and you're you're still working the ship is still transporting things how did how did it come that you were finally uh, discharged from the service. Uh, come again? How did you, what was the circumstances of your discharge? Oh, when I uh, got my points, the uh, everyone, depending on their points, and their points were by age and by, uh, uh, by the time you served and by, uh, by dependents. I had no dependents, so uh, I, I didn't my points didn't come up uh, till way late, and that's <coughs> the best part of my whole uh, naval experience was that the war was over, and uh, I could have gone home if I had the points. But since I didn't have the points, I made a lot. I made trips to Japan and China and some of those exotic places that I had never seen without. Uh, with that, uh, we 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 were just going places in uh, during the war, where we were assigned. It wouldn't be places you would go. They said, "Well, some of them were those South Sea Islands. Some of them are beautiful places. I wouldn't mind going back and visiting some, but I never will make it now. But I have." I have a son who is uh, very successful in tool and die. He has started out in a little shop in Chicago working for uh, the owner of the shop and he got to do everything in the shop and, and then do everything in the office, do everything out on sales and then then he uh, bought the business, then he expanded in other uh, shops in the United States and, and then uh, down in Florida, Fort Lauderdale. And then, he, then he had a factory in, in Scotland and then he had a fa in, factory in Singapore for years and years. And uh, he got ri he's gotten rid of all those and now he's got factories in China and Malaysia. So I have some contacts there uh, in the Orient, after all, hmm. through my son. Right. It's been a wonderful experience for me. I was just a country boy, and still am. I've worked agriculture all my life, and I've been lucky. I, I know how to handle agriculture, and I own farmland that I got through being able to do that. Now, was there was there one other story about 
when you finally were discharged on your flight back home? Was that? Well, uh, we were, we were, I believe we were in Hong Kong when I got my orders to come back home. And uh, since I was an officer, uh, and, they, and they were uh, flying somewhat, some war-weary bombers back to the United States, and I had an opportunity to, to fly back to the United States. Well, I wouldn't have chose that, but hey, why not? I'd been through everything else, and, I, and I, while I had climbed through B-29s in Tinian, I'd never been in the air with any old, any bombers. Uh, so I, I said, sure, I'll fly back. And when we got aboard uh, that uh, bomber, it just had a, a bomb bay. There was no seats, no nothing in there, but oh. just play, just a cargo area. And lo and behold, we we flew through a storm. Wow, that you were dropping, and then you were in an updraft. And so you'd be laying there wrapped up in a blanket and getting uneasy and thinking, oh, maybe I better get up, sit up. And so then you'd try to sit up and you were in an updraft. You couldn't get up. So we have to try it a little harder. And so the next time when you try to get up, you were in a downdraft and you just throw yourself in the air. So <laughs> we were just rattling around in that thing and it would have been a lot of fun if we weren't as scared as we were and it was it was pitch black in that cargo hatch. But it was an experience. And you made it. <laughs> yeah. We made it everywhere uh, that everything was was quite an interesting was an interesting so experience. You when you were you returned to the States by that flight? And then, did you take a train back to Illinois? Where were you? De you know, where was your final discharge? Uh, well, it was kind of fuzzy because I was in the reserves, oh. and I was released released from active duty, and I think that was out in in California, and uh, I was assigned. Uh, assigned to uh, Treasure Island uh, right by uh, San Francisco. So I was there about a month. They uh, they looked at us as uh, naval officers that just got back from from overseas and they and I was signed for security and I was uh, investigating some some property that had been supposedly lost and so forth, but my, my heart wasn't in it. <laughs> I, if, even if I was on, maybe on the track to uh, solve it, I, I didn't solve any of the problems that I was assigned to. And, and the other thing was that here I hadn't, just barely got back to the United States and the darned, uh, uh, Um, the president was Truman. Uh, the uh, the uh, not the Coast Guard, but the the uh, Navy people. Uh, went out on strike and lo and behold I mean, the here's people the that been in the United the, States. The longshoremen went on strike or what? The longshoremen went on strike or the people lo loading the cargoes went on strike or? Well, well these were just ships out in the harbor at, in, in uh, uh, San Francisco or? In, in uh, uh, San Francisco and, and the the uh, civilians that were manning the uh, right. ships had gone on a strike 
and here I was just getting back from the service from overseas and I got assigned to, a, to, to be in charge of a ship out in the harbor. Uh, well, there was a way to do it, I guess, but it, I, I thought that was a, uh, something that I, I didn't have to have, but I did. So they sort of nationalized the, the private ships and put the naval officers in charge, and you were one of them, huh, my yeah. gosh? But we, but it was solved, so I didn't never took okay. the ship out or anything. I was so just, you finally did get home. I did get home and and come back to the home farm, and uh, it all started because uh, we were not very successful. Mother had been widowed ten years bef in, in thirty one. My mother was widowed, and we lost my father and brother in a drowning accident. They were trying to save uh, some people that were in the water and uh, a, a preacher, my father and my 12 year old brother were drowned in an effort to, oh, how tragic. to save uh, somebody that was out in, out in the uh, uh, Mississippi River and, and we weren't we weren't, uh, we didn't really know what was going on. Uh, looking back at it uh, after it had happened, there was a, uh, a uh, river barge went by and we should have known that would make an undertow and current. We didn't know it. We weren't swimming, but there were some other people swimming and my father and the preacher and my brother uh, made a living chain and tried to reach out to him, but somebody in the chain didn't 